75% of the garden groups were able to give some of their harvest to food banks and hungry neighbors. But the gardens offered much more than food. They provided islands of shade and cooling in the hot Manhattan summers. A single acre could absorb up to two tons of sulfur dioxide, a major threat to people's respiratory health and the main component of acid rain. The diversity of crops, flowers, shrubs, and trees created habitats for a variety of birds, insects, and other wildlife. One beekeeper alone was able to produce over 100 pounds of honey a year. And most important, the once blighted vacant lots were transformed into vibrant, attractive community gathering spaces. The green space reduced stress among local residents, boosting both mental and physical health. Weddings, birthdays, cookouts, music fests, and political rallies became regular social events in the gardens. The result was community pride, stronger ties among neighbors, and a shared mentality that no longer tolerated shabbiness and crime. Eat. We'll leave off there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I want to thank everybody to come, for coming to the New York City Food Policy, Food Policy for Breakfast Seminars here in East Harlem. Uh, my name is Charles Plack, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Food Policy Center and a professor here at Hunter College. We're all very excited uh, to hear from the impressive experience and dedicated and engaged panel of experts. In fact, I had sent for several of them outside on our patio earlier, uh, giving me advice on how we can transform that into uh, a workable garden and get nearly 3,000 pounds of food a year, which I'm very excited about. I'm holding that to you, Tony. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I want to uh, thank um, Aziz uh, Dekan, uh, uh, the executive director of the New York City Community uh, Garden Coalition. Uh, I'm going to attach it everybody's name, so please bear with me. Uh, Bill Asasso, uh, director of, the Green, of Green Thumb. Steve Frillman, executive director of Green Gorillas. Tony Hillary, founder and executive director of Harlem Grown and Lenny Labrazzi, Director of Green Infrastructure at Grow NYC. Um, and I think it's just a, a testament to how important um, community gardens are to our city by having all these wonderful panelists uh, here, to, here today. Um, before we start, Aziz is going to give us a brief introduction um, uh, to, to community gardens, and, uh, and then we'll begin with our panel. Hi everyone, can you hear me? I usually don't use microphones, so if I start fading back, I, I wander while I talk, so, uh, uh, so just... Okay. So I'm Aziz Dekhan, I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I, I'm really glad all of you could make it here. Um, we're really excited about what's happening in community gardens. Um, the coalition has been around since 1998, and um, it seems like the fights that we fight continue. It never ends. I mean, I was just talking to Tony and some of my other colleagues here and friends, and when we saw the video, you realize that nothing really changes. I mean, we keep fighting for land, and we keep talking about who owns land, and um, we hope that by the end of this little discussion that we have, you'll join the fight and go out there with your shovels and pitch pitchforks and, uh, and plants and, and start taking land that's vacant. Um, and you'll hear who we, who we go against and, and who are our allies. And it's a, it's a fight, and it's a good fight. As Tony and I were talking, it seems like it never ends, and that, uh, you know, how do you win? My personal feeling, and I think a lot of us feel this way who are in the movement, we have a lot of momentum. We may not be winning a lot, but we're being recognized. And when you go out and you go in front of people who are in power, uh, though I would argue what that means, um, not here, but when you go up against the city officials, um, they recognize who we are, and they recognize what we're fighting for. And uh, I think maybe in their hearts, they probably agree with us. So um, we have to just keep pushing that dialogue and keep pushing forward. So the coalition started in 1998. 
Um, in the 70s was, as you saw, were the first community gardens. Um, in 1978, I'm going to run through this. Oh, how does this? This is just on its own. No, it's, it just took off on me. So the first community gardens uh, were cleared, designed, and planted. Um, the, a lot of people, Adam Purple, you know about Liz Christie, the Green Gorillas. Um, seed bombing became a really important piece of what we were doing. Um, I, I had been living in, um, I grew up in New York City, and um, I had a farm in New Jersey around that time. I had one of the first organic farms in New Jersey. And I had friends who lived on the Lower East Side, and we were doing the same thing on a much smaller scale of cleaning up, um, you know, vacant lots and trying to plant. Uh, my friends lived on Eldridge Street, and we, we tried to do whatever we could. So, you know, it was, it was a community effort. A lot of people really worked hard to make this happen. Um, in 78, uh, Operation Green Thumb happened, um, Adam Purple, and then, <laughs> boy, this just keeps happening. <laughs> really. Um, anyway, Adam Purple uh, Garden, which you can see here, I mean, he did all of this, all of this stuff, everything you see in this picture came out of the rubble from that, from that uh, lot, and it, it's pretty amazing to see. Uh, there's a lot of people who say that the Imagine uh, uh, Garden in uh, Central Park mimics this, and I think there's a lot, lot of truth to that. Um, but Adam Purple literally single-handedly put something like this together, and uh, in 1986, they bulldozed it. Um, so then our dear friend Rudy Giuliani was sworn into office, and um, uh, vote Tuesday, by the way. Um, <laughs> Rudy Giuliani was sworn into office, and he started to tell HPD, which is Housing Preservation Department, um, to identify abandoned lots. Uh, this is where we get a little bit of semantics. Um, community gardens were not abandoned lots. They were lots that were taken over by people. And they, they were being taken um, and cleaned up by people. So the abandoned piece is a little bit disturbing. Um, and, you know, the dates just keep coming. The hits keep coming. Bulldozed in, in May. Bulldozed in November. Um, in 1995, uh, Green Thumb... we got to learn how to do this. Uh, Green Thumb... 36 gardens were transferred into the Departments uh, of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Bill DeSasso, who is here, uh, uh, heads up Green Thumb, <clears throat> will probably tell you a lot more about what they're doing. Um, and we, we're allies with a lot of people in government. I mean, it's not, not everyone in government's evil. Right, Bill? And, uh, and, and, and we work with everybody. I mean, whoever wants to work with us, we work with them. And um, there are a lot of people who believe in, in, in this. So the list keeps going on. In 1997, really, there were a lot of there was a lot of things going on with petitions, with marches, with um, you know, uh, we had a bulldozing hotline. Again, really, Rudy Giuliani was available for us. Um, I'm going to skip through to 19, hmm, 1999, where we really started doing more protests um, and and just getting media attention. Um, Bette Midler stepped in um, and started to do, with New York Restoration Project, put a lot of her personal money into buying lots and making sure that they were not being auctioned off. Um, this auctioning off continues to this day. Um, there's, um, well, we'll talk about it during the discussion, but there, are, there were 34 gardens that the HPD wanted to take away nearly a year ago. Uh, we fought all of last year to stop that from happening. Um, we saved all but nine, and so we're still fighting on those nine. Um, and, you know, HBD, and this is a real issue, HBD and the city are now creating, and have always created, a wedge between affordable housing and open space and community gardens. And what happens is that community gardens are in fact in the most desperate and, and mostly low-income neighborhoods. And they provide a meeting space for people. And when they provide that space, it changes the neighborhood. The woman who runs HPD, um, at, when she was at NYU, she put together a paper that said that community gardens that are uh, properties that are within a thousand feet of community gardens see their property values go up. Vicki Bean, who's the, who's the commissioner of HPD who wrote this, doesn't like me. Because every time I see her and we're in a meeting, I ask her, so is the reverse true? When you take away a community garden, do those property values go down? And she'll never answer that. 
And I quote her. I, I, know, I know that paper backwards and forwards. I read it all the time because it just makes me furious. So that's what we're up against is, is the, the value of land and the wedge between affordable housing and between community gardens. And, and let me just say it this way. There is a lot of land available. Don't let anybody fool you. There are, the HPD owns a lot of buildings that can be rehabbed and made into affordable housing. Don't let them fool you that that's not the case. We keep asking them for a list, and we never get it, because they say, we're still in inventory. I'll let you decide what that means. So in 2002, there was a general agreement um, by uh, Bloomberg and Elliot Spitzer, um, and it stipulated the preservation of 198 community gardens, 110 community gardens as subject to development, and which means they either become housing or per become permanent. Um, 38 community gardens were scheduled for immediate development. And um, so Elliot Spitzer, I love this quote, uh, he says, while we recognize there's a housing shortage, we can balance worthwhile objectives and preserve open spaces as well. We were able to play this role only because of what you, the people, had done. And as so often the case on issues of this nature, it's really the public that leads government and not the other way around. And, you know, um, I'm sorry Elliot Spitzer got into so much trouble because that's, those, are, those are really good words uh, coming from a, a politician and truer today than, than probably ever. Um, so in 2007, we did Earth Day. Uh, we did testimony in front of everybody. We were a big part of the People's Climate March. We walked through. We were one of the few, actually, who were um, uh, Ray Figueroa, who's the New York City Community Garden uh, Coalition Board President, um, who's been in this movement forever. Um, and, and he's a young man, um, has uh, spoke there. And we were really excited to be a, a, a major part of this. Um, so we're coming up to a couple of really awful things. Uh, on December 28th, in, uh, 2013, uh, <laughs> I have a hard time talking about this. Coney Island uh, Community Garden, uh, Boardwalk Community Garden in Coney Island was a garden that had been there for over 17 years. When Hurricane Sandy came, and, uh, it was right on the boardwalk. When Hurricane Sandy came, it destroyed that garden. And wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow, sand grain by sand grain, they cleaned up that garden and brought it back to life. And uh, Marty Markowitz, who was the uh, borough president, had the $61 million amphitheater public-private partnership plan, and he was going to be put right on top of this thing. If you know Coney Island, about th five blocks away, there's a baseball stadium for minor league baseball. It's never used half, half of the baseball season, never used half of the year. That wasn't good enough. We needed an amphitheater. So um, in the middle of the night, literally 5 o'clock in the morning on December 28, 2013, they bulldoze it into the ground. And again, I guess you, you'll realize that I'm a person of many questions. And so my question to Mr. Markowitz was, if you're so damn proud of this amphitheater, why don't you bulldoze it in the middle of the night instead of having a nice ribbon cutting ceremony at two in, in two in the afternoon? Um, so we've been in court on this case for quite a while. Um, the court system's a little strange sometimes. Um, and uh, so we went through three judges who each one recused themselves. Um, they kept building. We asked for a temporary restraining order. We were told that we could do it if we put a million dollar bond down because the developer had already put so much money into it. Um, I, I, that, that just boggles my mind. I never knew that you could stick your finger in a judge's eye and get away with it. Uh, I know that I wouldn't be able to. I'd probably be in Guantanamo. So uh, it would be really interesting to see how, how that works. We, are, we lost the case, and I'm going to say thankfully we lost the case. Uh, now we're in the appeal court. Um, and. In a few weeks, we'll, we'll be having another hearing. And uh, we have a really good case on this. It's on an environmental issue case, and it's on a uh, public trust doctrine case. We believe strongly that we can win this. Uh, we, can't get, we can't destroy the amphitheater, though believe me, I would like next December to bulldoze the amphitheater. But you know, that's just me. Um, uh, uh, so we will, we will pr prevail in this, I believe, and we will set a precedent for all community gardens so that this never happens again. So that's, that's our goal in that. Um, we have some really good news on the other hand. Um, in 2015, uh, actually a year ago today, um, we rolled out what's called Gardens Rising. And uh, Gardens Rising is uh, a product of the Governor's Office of Sandy Recovery. It's state money that's coming to the New York City Community Garden Coalition. Uh, 47 community gardens on the Lower East Side are part of this project where we will try to prove 
that uh, we can be community gardens. Well, <laughs> I should back up. We know that community gardens are part of the resiliency and sustainability of this great city. Uh, we need to prove it to the city. Um, this is state money, so I want you to want to be really clear. The city does not give us money for this, but it is the first time that the state has given community gardens um, money to do something. And so the project is to make community gardens infiltrate more water um, to create more resiliency and sustainability. We believe it's a replicable project that we can take to other gardens throughout the city, up throughout the boroughs of the city. And we're really excited about it. Um, we feel that we always talk about community gardens as a neighborhood thing, and it is. I mean, it's, it brings all of us together, it brought all of us together into this room today. And what's really important is it brings people of every ethnicity, of every gender, of every class, and, and it just, it's, it's a place, if you had seen community garden in Coney Island, you'd see what it was like. I mean, there were just so many different people there. So we know that that's what it's about, and we always talk about that. I think this project and different projects like this will show, will give a metric to community gardens where we can say, look, this, we already know how many tons are being produced. We're, we're really good, we're getting good at re being able to put those numbers out. But I think this is really important to show a metric to go back to sustainability and resiliency that the mayor keeps talking about. It goes back to what makes this city a livable city and it takes hopefully the wedge away from affordable housing and community gardens and that they can coexist together. So that's my presentation of how we see community gardens and we'll do a panel. Thank you so much, Aziz. If the panelists could come up, please. Uh, for, for coming today. Um, Aziz, we heard from you, but it would be great to go along and um, introduce yourself and, and what your relationship to Community Gardens is. If it would start with you, it would be great. Um, Aziz De Khan, I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I've been in that position for a few years, three, four years, I think it is now. Um, that's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Osasso. I'm the Director of Green Thumb, which is the New York City Parks Department's Community Gardening Program. I've uh, been in the role for about uh, nine months now. It's been baptism by fire, starting right as the garden season was uh, beginning this year. It's, uh, it's been great. And I am a community gardener myself. Um, and I gardened at one of the gardens that Aziz is helping through Garden Rising in the Lower East Side. Uh, my name is Steve Frillman. I'm the executive director of the Green Gorillas. Um, as you saw in Aziz's presentation, we, uh, the Green Gorillas got started in the early 70s throwing seed bombs into vacant lots, and then took on a big vacant lot on the corner of Bowery and Houston Street, which is named after the founder of the Green Gorillas. It's the Liz Christie Garden. And so the first decade or so of our existence, we really spent a lot of time just helping people create community gardens. And as the community gardening movement kind of moved forward and matured, we segued into uh, helping community garden groups sustain their gardens, sustain their garden groups, um, and really use their gardens as, as cultural centers and education centers and places to grow food. 
and we also engage youth. And um, so we just sort of, uh, New York City is a complicated place. There's lots of community gardens and lots of nonprofits. If we invited all the nonprofits that work with community gardens up on the stage, we would need about 12 more chairs. So we just sort of sit in the middle of all that and just really try to be a resource center for as many community garden groups as we can. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Tony Hillary, founder and director of Harlem Grown. Um, we're a small nonprofit. We operate here in Harlem. Um, and we kind of um, merge community gardens and urban farming in the most vulnerable um, communities that, like Harlem. We work with extreme poverty in the middle of food deserts, and we have a national dialogue of eat healthy and all these little catchphrases. Uh, where we work, it's not hard to do, it's literally impossible to do on the budgets that the families that we serve have. So we take and repurpose some garden space and we grow tons of organic produce. All of the food we grow is free for our children and their families. And it's not as simple as just giving people food. We have to teach them what is the food, how to prepare it, what, you know, the, the nutritional value. So it's basically education. We partner with elementary schools right here in Harlem, and we have an in-school um, Harlem Growner. But it's really a mentor, sustainability um, liaison with the school, and we impact the children every day. Every single day it becomes part of the school day, and from that it becomes part of their lives. So we're only five years old, and we're still getting all the numbers, but every year it's, it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lenny Labrizi. I am the uh, Director of Green Infrastructure at Grow NYC, where I've been for in various roles for 31 years. Uh, Grow NYC has uh, several programs. The, the green markets in New York City are operated by Grow NYC, as are um, <clears throat> over 500 uh, school gardens that are part of our Grow to Learn program. We have a, a slew of youth-oriented programs uh, in addition to um, Grow to Learn. And we have a recycling program. And um, uh, myself, I work in the greening program where we work with community gardens uh, throughout all five boroughs uh, to um, help create new gardens, uh, help renovate and improve existing gardens and work in ways as many ways as possible to ensure their longevity. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. So um, what I'm going to do is first ask some uh, general questions to the panel and, and, and feel free to just sort of take over and take the mic um, right in front of you. So the first question I have is, you know, why are community gardens so important? We, we heard some of that before. Uh, beyond the obvious benefits of growing fresh and local foods, what are some of the psychological impacts that you've seen in neighborhoods from transforming a vacant lot to a community garden? You discussed that somewhat uh, before, you know, when you were, you were talking about that paper that was written. And, and uh, just wondering, you know, what, what does it do in a, in a community when it's, it's brought there, and not the real estate values, but uh, the psychological implications of it? And, and how does it make people feel, you know, when they see a vacant lot that all of a sudden becomes something that they can actually eat from? Maybe I'll start us off. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a good question. I think when people think of gardens, they think of flowers, they think of food. Um, but what we hear as much as anything from our gardeners is that gardens pull blocks and neighborhoods together. New York is a place that's evolving. People are moving in, they're moving out. Um, but gardens are this, this physical asset within communities that cut across so many boundaries and they pull people together. People who probably only saw each other passing them on the street. You see somebody carrying groceries and you nod and you keep walking. Now these people are meeting each other. They're participating in stewarding uh, a public open space. They're caring for nature together um, in their block and they're building bonds and I think they're strengthening neighborhoods, strengthening blocks. And you're more likely to look out for your neighbor when you've done something and gotten to know them. So I think it's a really important aspect that sometimes is overlooked. Yes, I wanted to touch on that also. Um, where we work, we have the, the people who've been in Harlem for a very long time, a lot of them are stuck in this vicious cycle of poverty. And some of my board members actually live in Greenwich, Connecticut, or up in Scarsdale. 
And I defy anybody in this room to come up to our farm on a Saturday and tell me which child is from where. You cannot tell. I mean, it just brings everyone together around green space. It's their space. It's something that they built. They own it, and they take such pride in it. And we just love watching that. And you're bringing out people who live next door to each other for years and didn't even know they lived in the same building, and here they are on a bed pulling weeds or turning compost or whatever. So it's like a really community building, uniting space. A kind of interesting um, psychological impact that, that I have read about over the years and I often mention when I speak is that um, n not community gardens specifically, but just green space or a tree outside of a young girl's window will raise her self-esteem. They actually did this kind of research and they found that this has its effect on, effect on young girls and they didn't find it for young boys, but there is, <laughs> there is one, I mean, so somebody did some kind of research on that. But just the fact of being able to see a tree outside your window. And, and there's been a lot of research done uh, in and around hospital patients, same thing, that they heal quicker if they look out and see a, 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 some kind of greenery outside the, their hospital window as opposed to a brick wall or a win, you know, another window across the hallway. My next question is about, um, how, and, we, and we, again, we touched upon this with thinking of bulldozers going in and, and, and sort of taking down community gardens. Um, what about sustainability, and, and uh, you know, especially those in prime real estate neighborhoods? And, and, and as, and as uh, communities gentrify um, and land becomes more valuable, uh, what can we do as a community to protect them? Is it just trying to buy them before they become before it becomes a gentrified community? Is it is it somehow maybe thinking about um, rooftop gardens as, as as a way of getting this uh, you know getting involved, or is it is it you know I see a lot of these um, public spaces that have to be developed by real estate developers in order to comply with zoning with zoning. Um, is it all of the above? Um, you know, there's got to be some sort of secret sauce out there that can uh, that can protect these, you know, vital, impactful, you know, community gardens? I, I would suggest that, that we're the, we're the people, we're the so secret sauce that can stop that. I don't see, I mean, we have to fight, we have to fight developers, we have to fight the city. Uh, I think if you look at the politics of, of the city from the very beginning of when the salty people came here, um, the city has always been run by developers and you don't get elected uh, into this into any office basically unless you have developers behind you so it's it's everybody it's the people that have to stop this it's people who have to you know buy land if that's the way it is or squat and make sure that once once they're there that you can you hold on to it um, we keep fighting this fight again I mean I just I, I sound like a broken record but it's the way it is um, you have to, you have to agitate. You have to, you have to work inside and outside the game. I think. Um, I have an issue with open spaces that are public-private spaces. I don't think they quite work because they're gated. Um, they're usually pretty exclusive and they're hard to reach. Um, they're concrete typically, and so I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. But I am a fan of anything that can be created open space. And the last thing is just like rooftop gardens. Accessibility is a real issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we as a coalition, um, prefer to see on the ground and um, people working it and holding on to it. You just got to keep fighting it. I mean, we own this land. We own this city. We are the people of the city. And so I really, I truly believe that. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe in that simple idea. And so that's how I think my organization, our organization, views it. Um, hold on to the land and keep finding open space. and creating more, more space, and working with allies who will help us do that. Do all of you have legal counsel, like sophisticated <laughs> legal counsel? I'm just curious, is that what you, do you all, 
Are you all in, are you all in courts fighting battles over, over these kinds of issues or not really? Uh, well, the Parks Department certainly has a room full of lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we operate on um, Lawyers Alliance. We get pro bono counsel when needed. But um, it's, I mean, to speak on what Aziz was just talking about, I can only speak of it from one place, and that's where I am every day. 90% um, of the people we serve live underneath the poverty line. 100% of our children are on food stamps. 40% live in homeless shelters. This is where we are. And so when they come in and say they want to build affordable housing, first off, define affordable. What's affordable? <coughs> then they have the 80-20 split. So they want to come in, take a garden, build a 10-unit building. Only eight have to be, eight could be market rate, and two would be affordable. So, I mean, this is the, the back and forth that you go into. I mean, we have a greenhouse that sits on an HPD lot that we feed 52 families a month from. They wanted to throw us out and build a 10-unit building for just what we just said. But cooler heads prevailed, and they came through, and they gave it to Parks, who let us keep the, the, con the um, licensing. But that's just that one. Now we just got pushed out of two other ones. So, Is, is part of it trying to get it designated as a park? Is that sort of the method? Is Absolutely. That, that's the goal? Well, I want to pick up on something, as, as you said, and maybe a similar vein of thought. I don't think that there is a secret sauce, but I think one of the most important things you can do is to utilize these spaces and, and to make them active. And if membership goes down a little bit, outreach to your community and get people involved. To me, that's, you know, you can talk about licensing and designation and, and legal mechanisms, but when you show that these are vital community resources, I think that speaks as loud as anything. Um, I used to manage a garden, and at the end of every year, we would write a final report, and we would have a celebration, and we would invite our elected officials and people from the Parks Department and the people that make decisions and show them this is what we're doing in real time. These are the children that are benefiting, as Tony mentions. These are the senior citizens that come here and enjoy these spaces. You know, how can you argue that this is not an absolute benefit? So I would say activate the space is an important part of it. And, and, is, and is it possible to sort of go in with the end in mind? You know, that this could be taken away from you and sort of figure out um, how to make sure that there is sustainability and security, or that's just a, a fantasy of mine. I'm sorry, can you clarify? Fantasy that? of mine. <laughs> <laughs> that basically, you know, going in with the end in sight. So, you know, when you see, a, you know, a vacant piece of land and you want to develop that into a community garden or a spot, right. you know, sort of do things in the beginning that would be, um, you know, sort of, everybody's all excited always in the beginning of a project. It's just that when all of a sudden, four years later, if you built this great you know, coalition of people and community and you know, all this connectivity, and then they say, okay, we're, you know, the area is gentrifying and the land is worth a lot of money and we'd like to do affordable housing here. Uh, I'm sorry, but we have an agreement from you know, the city saying that you can't do this for 25 years. You know, something like that. And again, this is not my space. I know no idea, but I'm just, that's what would come to mind to me. Well, there is a rule that, that was passed, and I'm, I'm really surprised you didn't mention that disease in, in the historical um, uh, timeline that you put up there, but there's a rule now that the city has to go through certain procedures. They sort of circumvented it in the, in the case of the boardwalk garden for other reasons, but in order for the city to take away a community garden once a lease has been signed with Green Thumb, there's a whole series of steps that the city has to go through, including finding an alternative location for the garden. Um, that was not in place many, many years ago. And that's, that's why there's been all of this legal, um, all the different lawsuits in order to get to that point. Yeah, I, think, I think one of the things that we're sort of dealing with is sort of protection versus permanence. So the rule, the city rules that Lenny has referred to provide a certain measure of protection for Green Thumb Gardens. The rules essentially say if it's an active Green Thumb Community Garden, it will remain an active Green Thumb Community Garden. But, uh, and this administration has given no indication that they're not going to follow the rules or that they're going to repeal the rules. But a future mayor, future administration could. So moving forward, looking to that, we would have to look at perhaps trying to get legislation passed that would make the gardens permanent, where you mentioned the notion of, you know, holding up a 50-year lease, so some kind of long-term lease. So, um, so that's really what we're going to have to start wrestling with in the community gardening movement in New York City is 
the gardens do have a measure of protection, but how comfortable are we with that? Um, and as, you know, if you have a future administration that says, we're just going to build, 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 that could change. So that's really what we have to wrestle with. And then I guess on, on top of that, on top of that question, going back to Tony talking about affordable housing, it is is it, is it part of the discussion that you know, okay we want affordable housing, um, we, we 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 like that, um, but we also want community space and community garden. Is that part of the discussion, or is that as not even that's not in there, you know, for developers? It, it seems to be that's the way that's the way they frame it all the time. But um, after we, you know, like with the greenhouse situation, I was at the table with two um, people, two developers who wanted to build on it, and they were proposing the rooftop um, farm, whatever. But once, uh, like Lenny said, I mean, as he said, there's no access unless you live in the building. You can't get in there. I mean, so there's. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It could be both. If you build, if you build smartly and utilize the ground, there could be green space that could be utilized by the community, as well as the residents in the building. But the, the conversation seems to be one versus the other. It's yet to be, how do we do both? And that's what we're hoping for. So it's not really part of the plan. It's really, now, it's really an us against them model right now, but it could potentially be if the city took took upon itself to say that okay, developers, all you developers out there, we not only want to talk about affordable housing, we want to talk about public space, and that public space needs to have some sort of community garden minded, open to the community uh, kinds of things attached to it, and then that would change the discussion. Is that am I getting that right? For me, yes, that would. Well, we're, there's an interesting model going back to this HPD decision that was made about a year, that, uh, as a year ago the disease alluded to. There were four gardens on a block that was mostly empty space that the city plans to develop. And the RFP that went out to develop this, this block um, mandated that the four existing gardens had to be part of the site design. Now, they may not be in the same location. They may be moved a little bit to accommodate whatever the, the, the site plans are, but you're seeing that there is a compromise being struck between the need for affordable housing and also preserving these gardens that have been there for you know, 15, 20, 25 years. And over the years, there's been various um, programs. We, uh, we at Grow NYC had a program called Housing and Open Space, which we um, uh, did with the Trust for Public Land and the Enterprise Foundation. So there was a housing partner, there was a development partner, us, and there was uh, in development in terms of the garden, and then there was a land preservation group, the Trust for Public Land. And what we identified was that there were a number of smaller neighborhood development groups that were given land over, over the years, and usually they were little pieces. They weren't a big giant like the the, the one that Bill just mentioned, they weren't a big giant piece, but they were smaller pieces and very often in, written into the, um, the agreement with the local group between the group and the city was that, well, we want you to renovate this building and build a certain number of units, but then there's a, this extra piece of land that we really, you know, they didn't mandate that they made into open space, but we assisted them in, in, to, to make that happen. So there is options like that. And there still are housing groups. Um, Northeast Brooklyn Housing Development Corporation has a number of community gardens that they, they have included in, their, in their, the land that they manage. And they have youth programs somewhat like, like the one that Tony has. Uh, so not every developer thinks that way, but there are models of this and there are ways to do it. It, it just seems to me it just, it, it, it's such a powerful thing to have in any kind of you know building project that that it's a, it's a no-brainer. But I guess it is you know land it does become so costly. Um, <clears throat> what are what are each of, what are each of your prospective organizations do to promote community gardens? Do you have uh, policies that preserve community gardens itself, or, or you know what, what what sort of talking around that same topic is is there Anything um, additional that you do uh, um, to preserve your community garden? Other than fighting or protesting or litigation or trying to get better land leases or including them in, um, in, you know, in, in city zoning 
Are there any, is there anything else that we're leaving out? So Green Thumb is, is the license, <clears throat> the license giver for all gardens on the city land, whether it's not the Parks Department or, or otherwise. Um, and we have an entire outreach team. So what we have is we'll soon have nine individuals who are responsible for going out into the neighborhoods and helping these garden groups grow. You know, we have about 600 gardens that we help throughout the city. I think that number surprises most people that there's that many gardens, um, largely clustered in five or six neighborhoods. Um, but they're out there trying to pull people in to see how beneficial gardens are, and we'll hang up signs. We go to churches, we go to schools, we go to CBOs, we go to various nonprofits to get people involved. And just maybe a little plug for Green Thumb, but one thing we're planning to do in the off season is, as I mentioned, we have probably three or four hundred gardens that are clustered in the neighborhoods you would guess that, that suffered from you know disinvestment years ago, and that's where the vacant land was to create gardens. Um, but we believe in um, that the garden should be available to every New Yorker, not just those that happen to live in these in these neighborhoods. So we want to start um, a, a program where we can identify vacant lots so every New Yorker lives within a five or ten minute walk of a community garden. It's going to be tough. There's there's not a lot of vacant land in the Upper East Side. There's not a lot of vacant land in, in other neighborhoods throughout the city, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying and talking to our sister agencies and see where there may be an opportunity to start a new garden and bring those benefits to a whole neighborhood that may not otherwise have access to it. Right. And, and, and why aren't some of the more park, you know, some more of the New York City parks developing uh, community gardens? Is that? I'm sorry. Why why aren't more New York City parks developing you know community within gardens the parks within, the, within those parks? Yeah. It, it does exist. We have I don't know maybe five or ten gardens that are within parks, and we are getting a lot of requests now in the neighborhoods that there's not a lot of vacant land. People are saying you know we have a large park and could probably use a little bit of extra love, or that we've seen an area that's maybe a little shady and isn't perfect for, for a playground or whatever, we'd like to start a garden here, and we'll always entertain that discussion. It's, you know, a lot of parties have to weigh in on it, but I think, you know, at least in the short term, it's probably a, a good way to try to close the gap. And is it difficult to get designated as a community a garden in the city? You know, it depends on the neighborhood needs. You know, if you have a small park, you know, the, the department's less likely to give it up to a, a smaller group of people to just steward a garden. But we have massive parks throughout the city, um, and I think it does make sense in some some spaces to partition off, I don't know, an eighth of an acre, a quarter of an acre, and let people start a garden to grow fruit and flowers, and to, like I said, get together, convene, and meet each other. And, and is there sort of a, um, if someone wanted to start a community garden, what's the first thing that they would do? They would go to the city, or go to one of your organizations to ask for help, or? Yeah, the first thing you can do is pick up the phone and, and call me. I answer the phone. My <laughs> deputy director answers the phone, and one of my outreach coordinators in the audience definitely answers the phone. Um, we'll help you if you're in a neighborhood. Find either a garden that you can join that needs members or is looking to grow. Uh, we'll also help you try to find a vacant lot that's suitable. You know, as you mentioned, there's agencies with their own needs. Sometimes it's not appropriate to put a garden there, but you know, we're in the business of starting gardens and supporting gardens, so. Um, give us a call and we'll start the conversation with you. There's a, a, a wonderful website called oasisnyc.net um, that maps or has mapped all the community gardens in New York City and all the vacant lots. And that was originally started in 1999 as a way to change the definition of what the city was calling vacant abandoned <coughs> lots and give it a name and give it a designation as community gardens, even if it wasn't an official park, but it was on the map as a community garden. So you can type in any address into Oasis and find, look and see which vacant lots are in your community and who owns it. So that's kind of the, almost the first step, but a good first step obviously is to call Green Thumb and they can do that part for you, but if you want to go to them and say, I just saw this lot, can I, put a garden there, you've sort of jump-started the process. The other part of starting a garden is it just doesn't happen by one person. You have to have a group of people. If you think you're going to do it on your own, you're not. Um, so that's a big piece of it. Started creating your garden group and figuring out, well, what are the rules? You know, who's going to take out the garbage? Who's going to open the gate? Um, who's going to deal with all of these groups here to try to get resources for us. All of that's important as well as well as getting access to the land. Is this some sort of community garden starter kit? <laughs> I mean, there's information out there, and 
on various websites. There's also a national community gardening organization called the American Community Gardening Association. Yes. Yeah, that uh, on their website they have how to start a community garden, how to start a school garden. And then all, all the, you know, there's various nonprofits that people can just like call and ask for help. Gotcha. Okay, great. And then, um, Tony, if you don't mind, how did you, how did you get involved in community gardens? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, that's not even on the list. I know. I, know. Well, I, I was very lucky. I, I was very lucky. Um, I did well in business, and in 2010, the financial crisis hit me as well as everybody else. And my children, they all went to private school, um, kindergarten to college, all my children. So um, I don't know. I had this time, and I kept reading about the state of schools, you know, like in, in, uh, in Harlem, the South Bronx, and I couldn't wrap my head around the disparity in education by the zip code. It didn't make sense to me, so I had to see for myself, so I went to volunteer. And I, went, I walked in off the street to the school, and I went into the lunchroom, and it was like a battle royal in there. I mean, it's an elementary school. Fifth grade, I mean, pre-K to fifth, so it was like five to 11, and kids were just, it was just, it was just bedlam. And, and I, just, I didn't understand what was going on. So then after I started coming every day and learning the, the demographic of the community, the numbers I just told you, um, it's, it was pretty startling. I mean, 80% of my kids live in single parent households. Like I said, 90% below poverty, 100% are on food stamps, 40% are homeless. In a school that there's no art, no music, and no gym, Kids go to school for reading, writing, arithmetic, and breakfast, lunch, and supper. And I had a conversation with this girl in kindergarten. She's telling me that tomatoes grow in Pathmark because she saw them in the um, thing with the little water coming down. So I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in New York City, the richest city in the country, and this is what I do every day. So I just started recycling, and then the kids say, hey, what are you doing? Recycling. What's that? Can I help you? And then all of a sudden, every kid in the school wanted to be part of something. So we created a green team. Started composting five years ago before it got sexy in the Department of Education. We were composting. And just by happenstance, right across the street, there was a, um, I would say abandoned, underused community garden that I found that was the license was expired or something, so I got it. And this, it's a big piece of land in the middle of Harlem, full of trash and everything else. And I'm like, okay, now what? Cleaned it out. It had 400 students, bought 400 seedlings from Home Depot, and they all planted it. And then when it started growing, they started eating it. And that's when the light bulb went off. Um, you would be surprised that children there, cannot, they can't identify vegetables. They can tell you a tomato, a carrot, broccoli, everything else is salad, 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 salad. And an eggplant is purple salad and they don't eat salad. So in a community that we counted where that farm is, our, we call our garden a farm. We counted 11 homeless shelters in a three block radius, 54 fried chicken restaurants, 29 pharmacies, and not one affordable food option in the same community. I work there, they live there. So this is how it happened. So when the kids started eating it, that's when the formula kind of made sense. If they plant it, they will eat it. Eight out of ten times they eat it, they like it, but then you're back to square one, where do you get it? So we started growing our own food. Five years ago we grew 38 pounds, last year we had 2,186 pounds. All free for the children and their families. It gets deeper, it gets deeper. You grow this stuff and you send it home and the parents don't know what it is. So they throw it away. What's kale? What's chard? What's arugula? So now, not only do we grow it with them, we teach them how to cook it. So the children go home and tell mom, I know how to cook, but I need X, Y, and Z. So we have a kind of multifaceted approach. We're trying to drive demand from the foot ground up. Because business is business. If 100 people ask for kale, the store will start carrying kale. But they're not going to carry it just to throw it away in two days. So it's a... It's, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. Um, five years ago, we were in one school. Now we're in six schools. We touch about 3,000 children a month. Um, 
and it's every day, and if it's any indication, last Saturday was our Halloween celebration, two locations of ours. We had 1,100 people. Wow. So, Say that number again. 1,100 people in two places that five years ago would have been lucky to have 10 between the two. 1,100 people, and the majority children. That's the power of community back, gardens. Yeah, that goes back to your question of how do you start community gardens, how they're sustainable. And, and listen, I admire all my colleagues on the stage, but when you see Tony doing what he does up in Harlem, that's pretty intense. Sorry. Um, and, and Steve, I guess your organization has been around doing this kind of work. That's the same organization that we saw on the film, right? <laughs> so, um, it's been the backbone of uh, community, community organizing has been the backbone of community uh, garden creation. How, how, do you, how do you get youth involved in, in this? And do you recruit or they come, people come to you and, and yeah. Well, we, um, you know, we, yeah, we've been around for 40 something years and oh, about 15 years ago or so, I think we kind of just got to a point where we said, you know, we don't, well, there's a plenty of activities in the community gardening movement where where young people can just come into a community garden to, to learn something and then kind of go back to their lives. Uh, and we decided that we wanted to really bring young people into community gardens and really make them partners. Partners with, uh, with us, partners with the adult community gardeners that are gardening and growing food and educating and really give them and really challenge them. So we created a, an internship program where we hire uh, teenagers to do paid internships where they grow food and build compost bins and install rainwater harvesting systems and, they, and it's work and it's challenging work and at the end of the summer they've learned about themselves, they've learned about each other, they've learned about gardening, they've learned about composting. Uh, we also support a program out in Crown Heights called the Youth Farm which is a one acre production farm that's again youth and farmers and adult farmers growing together, learning together, uh, running a farmer's market, running a CSA, doing community organizing, doing outreach. So in our little corner of, <coughs> excuse me, our little corner of the community gardening movement, we're just trying to, as I said, really, and then, you know, it, finding young people is easy because there are scores and scores and scores of talented young people in New York City. Our experiences has been they're looking to do positive things. They're smart, they're talented. We don't really need to teach them very much. And the trick is to just give them something to do. You know, help them learn by doing, not by giving them a workshop or, you know, having them come in and label plants or, I mean, all those things are really important. Like, you know, Tony's doing that in Harlem and there's young people like the young people that Tony's touching in neighborhoods all around the city and they just need an opportunity. So, and there are, we're not the only ones who are doing that. There's lots of other groups who are doing it. But we just sort of came to that point in our sort of life cycle as an organization where we, we kind of made that shift of, of even, if it's, even if it's six young people in a summer or 10 or 12, if they have the opportunity to actually work all summer doing this stuff and they can work side by side with a community gardener who's been doing it for 30 years, um, who's as old as their parents or grandparents, and they are side by side in true partnership with them, you can just see it by the end of the summer there. They've got a whole new sort of look at what they can do with their lives, what they can do with their families. They're taking recipes home, they're taking vegetables home, so it's, and then, as I said, we're not, the, we're not the only ones who are doing that, there's lots of other people doing that. So, so that's, what we've, that's what we've decided is, can be a good contribution that <clears throat> and, people, and, and young people can just apply to your program, is that how it works? They just... um, well, we're funded mostly by foundations, so every year our program changes. We're not set in stone. So, for example, this past summer, all of our youth were from the High School for Public Service, which is the school that's next to the youth farm in Grand Heights. But we've had programs that have taken place in uh, the South Bronx and Central Brooklyn and Southeast Queens and... Um, so it just depends on where our funding is. Our program kind of changes year to year. And Lenny, I have a question for you. And, and, um, 
you say you've been in this area of space for 30 years, you know, in, in, at Grow NYC. So what do you think, what's changed in your, in, in, for, good or for, for good or for bad um, in the community garden movement? Well, when, when <clears throat> I first started and I would have said to you I work in community gardens, you would have looked at me in a puzzled way and said, well, what is that? Uh, now, people, I don't even have to say anything. They, they have some kind of understanding, maybe not exactly what it is. So that's a big change. And uh, I keep saying that um, some one of these groups up here should give uh, Rudy Giuliani Rudy Giuliani an award because it was really him that that popularized community gardens and he tried to get rid of them but in the meantime when he was doing that the New York Times had articles on the front page the Washington Post the, the London Times you know the Los Angeles Times everybody was writing about it so now all of a sudden it's when I run into him at Fox News I'll let you know <laughs> Fade, fade, fickle finger, fade Exactly, right. <laughs> um, so that's changed a lot. And, and I, I think these days there's sort of a confluence of the idea of healthy eating um, and lo you know, buying local, and you can't get much more local than a community garden. So I think those kinds of ideas that are being, and, it, and it's coming from young people, not necessarily high school kids, but it's coming from young people who, you know, are looking in, in, in and saying, well, you know, what can we do to, to grow local, to, to uh, make our city livable? Um, so those things sort of weren't in the picture 30 years ago. Global warming, um, climate change, you know, people are starting to look at, well, you know, how can we be a resilient and a sustainable city? And those kinds of things, I think, you know, community gardens can definitely play a role in where, where it wasn't even something we thought about in 1987. I just want to open up to, for audience questions. Hi, I'm Linda Laviolette. I'm Director of Farmers Markets at Empire State Development. I just had a few comments. One, I think that we need to mention John Amoroso, who uh, worked from 1976 uh, to work, worked with a lot of community gardens. He probably was the grandfather of about 2,000 community gardens throughout uh, New York City. And he was funded through Cornell Cooperative Extension. And that, that position was eliminated. So that's something we could ask to bring back. And then the other thing about uh, underserved uh, communities, there are, there are examples, uh, for example, the bed Campaign Against Hunger, which is a community food uh, bank uh, or pantry. Last year, they grew more than 22,000 pounds of food that they then made available to um, to their pantry uh, consumers. So we see that that's going around, uh, happening around the state. And that those are good, good things. Thank you. I, I used to be a, a board member of the Bed-Stuy Community uh, uh, <laughs> Campaign Against yes. Hunger. Thank you. And uh, my favorite story about them is that they, they're, the lot behind their building was strewn with mattresses and garbage. And they took it upon themselves, again, to take over and clean the, the lot up, <clears throat> produce as much food as you're talking about. But one of my favorite stories is that the executive director who was there, when she, their first crop of beans, she herself didn't know how to deal with it, so she pulled the entire plant out and, and harvested it that way. And she came to me and she said, look. And I was like, no, 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 no. And so it was a learning experience for her. It was a learning experience for the kids. And just as a shout out to them, <clears throat> it's not just a food pantry, but what they did up there, it looks like a supermarket. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, pantries have a tendency, I think, to, to take away your dignity, and this does not. This is a supermarket where you can come in and get your food. <clears throat> it takes away what, you know, the, the whole notion of, of, I don't like to call it a desert, it's apartheid. And so it's just a way to, 
make people understand where their food comes from. Again, but we've, that's something we've been talking about. So it's a, it's a great organization. They do wonderful stuff. And there's lots of others very similar to that throughout the city. And the state. And the state. Um, it, the mention of uh, John Amoroso and Cornell Cooperative Extension uh, kind of brings back the, to where the history of, of the modern history of community gardens came from. And there, there used to be a something called the 23 Cities Program where um, cities throughout the United States were funded um, by the federal government. The money went to the state through the Cooperative Extension Services and that money came into whatever city was the, was the designated city in that state. Um, and so that makes me think about where funding comes from for community gardens in New York City. There's a lot of private funding that comes to Grow NYC and groups like, like Tony's and, and, um, and the Green Gorillas. Um, but up until maybe the past couple of years, the funding for the, the New York City itself did not contribute any to community garden funding. It all came from community development block grants through the federal government. And it's only been recently that any money has, is, is, is city levied tax dollars that are actually going to community gardens. So following the money trail, I think, is a big uh, important point here in terms of, of longevity and, and support of community gardens. And Lonnie's right that I think until just a couple years ago before I arrived, it was entirely CDBG funded. In the last two years, we've seen investments by the current administration. We've taken on uh, I think 12 or 15 staff members and probably a million dollars in expense money, which is really, you know, it's still not nearly enough to serve 600 gardens, but we're taking, you know, one step at a time. With each dollar, we can give a little bit more support to these gardens. With each staff member, we can provide a little bit more organizational support. I just wanted to add one more thing about um, gardens and parks. During World War II, most of the parks had community gardens, victory gardens, even Bryant Park. So there is precedence for having that. And we have one of the biggest in, in St. Albans, I think, one of the biggest community gardens out there. I'm just going to make sure that we get funding for my new garden now here. <laughs> so just, just uh, we, we need a, a top town and tells me that tells me we need 100 grand. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Diana Blackwell, and I'm from Central Harlem. I am a NYCHA resident. Five years ago, I, well, I had three gardens at my development. This year, NYCHA gave me a fourth garden. So I am continuing gardening in uh, Central Harlem. Now, I have three questions and comments. I'll address them all, and then you can take it. Aziz? Uh, for you, uh, just to recap something that you said. Is there a way that we can ne uh, negotiate with HPD that all of the new affordable, quote, uh, an unquote, affordable, unaffordable housing being built will be built with accessible rooftop gardens? Uh, next is, anybody can comment. On the psychological aspect or impact, I found that it's a mental exercise that teaches life cycles. Uh, experience like patience. I teach patience. Like if we plant a seed, this is how long you're going to have to wait for an answer. And believe me, I work with a lot of kids and adults that need to learn. Any of my students in there, you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> plant a seed, we have to wait for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and again, anyone. Uh, since I belong to a strong environmental and emergency preparedness group, what is the language that's being presented to the city? that gardening is part of a 360-degree preparation cycle for disaster and recovery measures in the city. Maybe I can just make a quick comment on, on patience. I'm thinking about, at, at our garden, we, we had a sunflower competition with the children gardeners, and at the beginning of the year, they all came and they planted a sunflower seed, and the goal was to see whose sunflower would, would grow the fastest. And they came back you know, three days later, and they couldn't believe that there wasn't this giant sunflower, and they came back three days later, and they said, where's the sunflower? And finally, one of the students said, I'm going to grow faster than this flower is going to grow. <laughs> so that was definitely seeing you know, uh, an exercise in patience in real time. So since you asked me specifically a question about HPD, no, that's fine. Um, 
You know, I'd like to, we'd like to negotiate with HPD. Uh, we have a hard time getting through that door, frankly. Um, so uh, that's, that. <laughs> if you can't sit down with your counterparts, uh, it's a little bit difficult to negotiate. Um, I could negotiate with myself really well, but uh, I tend to see to even lose on that. So it's, uh, it's, it's tough. Um, the rooftop garden thing, not so sure about it. Again, it's accessibility. Yeah, you know, put them, put rooftop gardens, but I think really which, what we need to do is, is push, push, push for, for more land for community gardens. And, and it becomes an economic issue for, for developers. I understand this, you know, we live in a capitalist society and, and, and that's the way things work. But I think you have to change that paradigm and flip it. And, and look at what what is more valuable to the community. What what do you what do you gain by just keep putting up vertical buildings without any open space? And it becomes a social issue. It becomes it becomes more than just affordable housing. I mean, you know, if 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 we wanted to, we could build affordable housing for everybody in the city. But we don't want to we don't want to face that reality of what that would mean and at the same time create open space and create make this a livable city. I mean, you know, we keep talking about that, and, and I think all of us individually have to decide what does that mean? You know, what does livable mean in, in, a, in a big, concrete city that has a limited amount of space? But, you know, again, eight, your rooftop gardens, sure, but accessibility is a huge issue. Um, I applaud you, frankly, for creating more NYCHA gardens. Um, you know, it's, uh, we'll, I'd like to talk, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's, that's how we have to, <coughs> have to say, we need to open a door. We have to have a door open, and if we have to kick the damn door open, maybe that's what we have to do to talk to HBD and just be able to sit and have a conversation about what that looks like and what's equitable and what, you know, equitability. Oh yeah, I, I don't think we would have an issue with that at all. But you know, it's just. I just don't want people to think you're anti. Uh, no, thank you, thank you. I am not. I am not. No, I'm for anything that that has green space. <laughs> Hi. Um, when Steve started talking about foundation funding, Tony seemed to indicate that there was more to that story. So I'm wondering hmm. if what uh, with local food being a hot topic right now. Where are the grants headed, and how are they controlling what you're able to do in terms of youth development? And are they going in the right direction? Because in youth development, what you are able to do is just about where you can get the money. Well, I got to, since you said my name, I'm going to jump on that. But this whole nonprofit world it seems to be upside down. Um, for the last 100 years, we've been trying this top-down approach. It doesn't work. Um, there's so many levels. I came from business, mind you, um, so it's kind of new to me as well. I've seen there's a lot of people making a lot of money on these problems. Um, and that being said, grants take, it's a full-time job to write a grant, and then you have to report on that grant. But then I still have these hungry kids, and the kid who doesn't know what a tomato is or how it grows. So what do we do? Do I not do the work until I get this grant? So I might not be the one to answer that question, because we do it backwards. We do the work anyway, and we always figure it out. And I don't know, by the grace of God, we've always been lucky. People find us. We don't go out and solicit, because where we work and how we work, that's part of the problem. Money, throwing money at this problem, it doesn't do anything for the children we serve. It's another tool. It's another rake or glove that's going to break and throw away. What makes us a little different is we leverage all of our corporate sponsors to not just write a check, but send your employees to come work with our children. We have this real weird idea that you can go into this community and say, hey, go to college. To my kids, what's college? It's a word. It's not a place. Be a doctor, be a lawyer, be Spider-Man. It's the same thing. Anybody in here who's even remotely successful has been surrounded by success their whole life. What if you don't have that? How do we reach those kids? So we do it by bringing downtown, uptown. And that's what we do. We use our community space because that is food is universal. Everybody has to eat. 
and we have this little place. It's very, we're a patch of dirt in the middle of Harlem. Yes, okay, we grow almost 3,000 pounds of food, but we plant seeds in the ground, but more important, we plant seeds in these children's heads, and that's what we're doing. We're growing healthy children through the lens of food. But the funding thing, oh my goodness, it's like a, it's multiple jobs. And in the nonprofit world, people don't work, people don't work for free. You have to pay people to write, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's a, it's like a revolving door that never stops. <coughs> but that's why I always make the face with the funding, because all programming is depending on the funding. But. I do it a little different. I did this for five years with no salary for myself. And that allowed me to, <clears throat> to grow to this level that we have in five years. But it is a fight for funding. It is a fight. You have to identify it. They want to they wanna support this portion of your program, but not that portion. And they can give you a whopping $10,000. <coughs> Well, whopping ten thousand dollars, and then you got to report on where every penny of that grant went. I mean, that's uh, I don't know, I don't know. I'm rambling, but that's my angst. It's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? We have this problem every day, every day. We have hungry children. We have children who are being they live in substandard housing. They go to substandard schools. They have no access to food. That's my fight. So what do I do? Wait for the check before I address that? No. So, thank you. So we have we have uh, time for about one or two more questions, and um, if that's okay, if we can run five minutes over, is that, that okay with everybody? Yeah. Yes. I always do anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it would be polite to ask. Hi, um, I'm Bethany Hogan from New York Restoration Project. Thank you, Aziz, for the shout out talks earlier, and also to comment on Tony. I could not agree with you more about how difficult it is to rally funding for the really core operations. You know, it's really easy to get funding for the sexy projects, but, oh, it's not really easy, but it's much easier to do that than, and, and like finding a way to wrap that together is a, a constant struggle for us. Um, I wanted to really quickly ask, because in our experience, we find that um, one of the really amazing, miraculous <coughs> uses of our gardens is you serving as like an experimental test bed for new innovations, particularly in resiliency. And I just wondered if you guys could talk a bit about that, about like using them as testing grounds um, and demonstrating value in that regard, rather than spending huge amounts of money on citywide initiatives, proving that something worked locally first. So um, the major thing that I spend a lot of my time on is uh, rainwater harvesting. And we've been doing that, and actually it started as a collaboration including the New York Restoration Project, and including the Green Gorillas, and including um, Green Thumb. Uh, and um, back when we first started, we, we would try to convince the Department of Environmental Protection, come on, you should be able to you should fund this so we could uh, build more of these rainwater harvesting systems that have the benefit of using less water, so we're not using the city water supply, they have the benefit of avoiding combined sewer overflows, so that's pollution into uh, the, the river and, and the water bodies around New York City. And it has a tremendous educational value because people see this in the, in the gardens and they're like, well, what is that? What does it do? Can, can we have more of that? Um, back then they were like, well, these are too small. They're not really going to have an impact. Their thinking has changed drastically over the years, and now they they promote something they call distributed infrastructure. So community gardens have become distributed infrastructure for rainwater harvesting systems and other types of green infrastructure. Um, and they are distributing rain barrels free to all over the city these days. So um, the, the thinking there has changed, but we've actually, um, I think, convinced people that this is an important piece of um, uh, resiliency and, and, and environmental uh, awareness and, and, and a benefit to both the garden and the city as a whole. And I'll, I'll give a quick shout out to a community gardener in the room, Ray Figueroa, their garden, Park Youth Farm in the Bronx, um, didn't wait for Green Thumb to lead the way. They, they just went ahead and did it. They're creating a wetland on site that's going to create rainwater runoff from 24 or 26 townhouses adjacent. I can't remember the number. This is going to completely prevent it from going into the combined sewer outflow, and they're creating sustainability right there in the middle of the South Bronx. 
Um, and they led the way. They came up with the design. They got the designers, the landscape architect. They came to us and said, this is what we want to do. Help us make it happen. And, and leading off of that, uh, I made Ray come here. <laughs> today. I, in, in, in front of a huge audience, I said, you have to come to the next event. So we're glad he's here. And he, yeah, I'd like him to say a few words if, if it's OK. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the uh, Hunter College folks, the Food Policy Center. Thank you, Charles, the director. Thank you guys, there are a few faces there. I'm, I'm looking at uh, all of you, and I salute the work that you're doing and the commitment that you bring to bear upon that work. Uh, I'm just uh, really shouting out Lenny and, and Steve. I've known them for a couple of decades now. And- Yeah, Ray was a young man when I first, <laughs> no gray hairs. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, Steve, and, and Lenny and John Amoroso, I literally ran uh, a lot behind John Amoroso, I think I, Everything I know, I, I, I owe to John Amoroso in terms of uh, agriculture. And Steve was the source of my first grant back in the day when he was a director at uh, Citizens Committee. So anyway, just wanted to say that. Um, we have Ms. Blackwell here. We have Cheryl Durant here. We have Angela Davis here. Uh, we have, not here, but we have women. Uh, Karen Washington, Nancy Ortiz Sorun, Yannette Fleming. Um, I think we, we need a part two. We have to have um, more of a balanced representation in terms of what sisters are doing and the vision that they bring to bear. Um, interesting that that, uh, that research finding, Lenny, that you alluded to with respect to trees and the impact that it's had on women. I think there's a real, something very, very special there uh, if we could hear from our sisters. So going forward, I would love to see something where uh, we have women uh, speaking to the power of community gardens. Um, so, so, so I just wanted to say in terms of the power of community gardens, you know, building on, on Bill's point, uh, one of the things that um, we've been doing, and, and this comes as a result of a developmental arc, uh, you know, just speaking, you know, just uh, so many things I want to say, but you know, if community gardens were just allowed to be, there is a developmental arc that has major uh, positive community development uh, potential and ramifications uh, if they just let us be. One of the things in um, talk about distributive in in infrastructure uh, in the South Bronx where I'm based, a uh, uh, number of us have come together and uh, as a pepper growing collective. And that pepper growing collective, whereas one community garden uh, may only produce but so many peppers, uh, we have come together. Uh, uh, as a result of this community organizing that's already uh, been in place, building on those community organizing successes, come together as a group and as a collective, we are the pepper growers for something known as Bronx Hot Sauce. And so we are, uh, we have, where one community garden couldn't, but a few, let's say three dozen or so community gardens, we have created uh, an economy of scale. And this has ramifications going forward in terms of the economic potential that community gardens represent. What I wanted to say is two, two things. Um, just the fact that community gardens came together and people in those community gardens, the respective members have said, you know something, this is what we would like to do. We would like to do rainwater. We would like to grow food. We would like to do things with the, with the school across the street. What's implicit in that is uh, a degree of self-determination. Self-determination is the very foundation of eliminating poverty, okay? This is how we, uh, you know, in the South Bronx, we have taken that foundation and have gone forward and built upon that to the point where we're doing this thing with Bronx Hot Sauce. So that's one. B, um, we also, Bill is aware of this, a number of the individuals that are, we have an alternative to incarceration program. What does that mean in economic terms? Well, in economic terms, you know, and it's a very modest program, we engage young people who are either formally incarcerated, I mean, I have a young man that's been with me from the summertime, um, came out of solitary confinement in Rikers Island. How do you, how do you incarcerate a young person? How do you uh, put them in solitary confinement? Is beyond my, is, is, is a horror that I can't even begin to wrap my head around. But we work with formerly incarcerated, currently court adjudicated youth. When one does the math, it costs over $300,000 to incarcerate one youth in the state of New York. Okay, so we have, you know, in the three years that we've been running, you know, maybe worked with about a dozen and a half young people. If you do the math, you can easily see that we're in the millions of dollars in terms of avoiding costs, saving the state. So, what, do, what does this mean in terms of the power of community gardens from an economic perspective? We are saving massive amounts 
of, of, of dollars to the taxpayer. And that we're also circulating income at a local community level. That's, that's a model here that I think really speaks to some really generally robust community development outcomes. Again, if we can just let community gardeners, if you just let us do what we do, we will get there. At Brook Park, where I am based, at Brook Park, we literally have uh, prevented two young people from being killed. Because I work with uh, youth that are affiliated with street organizations, street families, otherwise pejoratively referred to as gangs. And we've actually done gang mediation in Brook Park because we've developed those relationships. We, I, I literally invite the gang leaders to come in and do orientations for my new ones. And tell them, oh, come on. Do, do, tell them what it's like to be on the rock. Tell them what it's like to be at Rikers Island. And we do this over time, you know. Give the kid a couple of bucks, send some collard greens to grandma, you know, and it's all beautiful. And over the course of time, that same young person came to me one day and said, Ray, we got a problem with that kid there. We, said, we have some beef. The kid is a problem. So we were able, first of all, the fact that that young man uh, came to me, that, that gang leader came to me and said, Ray, you know, I, got, I need to talk to you about that. That right there is already harvesting a, a certain amount of uh, uh, community social capital, right? As a result of co cultivating that relationship. And we were able to leverage that relationship, that social capital that was cultivated in terms of preventing a young person from being killed. And we've done that twice over. Uh, and, and a third time, we prevented a young person from being viciously assaulted all as a result of the presence of our community guards. Could the police do that? No, they would be called in, hey, we got a bunch of kids coming in, and the next thing you would know, it would be a real fiasco from a mass incarceration of youth perspective. So, just wanted to put that out there in terms of the power of community guards. Finally, I'll just say this, that you know, in, in all of this, hey, how can we negotiate with HPD? How can this, uh, what, what can we do? What will, be, what will be the buzzword? Let's just remember something here. And it's something that Tony just kept revisiting over and over and over. Um, disproportionate levels of poverty. Yeah. It's an in-your-face reality. Um, you know, and this stuff with affordable housing, it says nothing does nothing to, to speak to what is ongoing, what is right now an in-your-face reality in our communities where this so-called affordable housing is, is supposed to be implemented. And so that's an ethical issue. The way development is being approached is an ethical issue. This is not a matter of negotiating, hey, how can we make this happen? No, we need to really address what's going on in the community, need to consult with people, and need to get uh, community consent. This is not what's happening. This is a major ethical concern, and we really need to like, you know, anchor these, this type of discourse in that. Address, consult, uh, and get the consent from community folks as to what is what is in the best interest of communities. So thank you very much. Thanks. Very great. So I, well, I want to thank I want I want to thank Aziz for for everything and Bill and Steve and Tony and Lenny for for coming and I know that it's you know coming up here to East Harlem is not always easy for everybody and I'm I'm so glad you're here. Um, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, I also want to thank um, the Food Policy Center's Director of Operation, Alexina Cather, and Emma Cosgrove, one of our uh, editors and writers. We've been doing about three or four stories every week um, on nycfoodpolicy.org. We sort of really have a powerful editorial mission. We just got picked up by Google News um, and, are, and are considered a real news organization now, which we, we really are excited about. Uh, make sure you check out our website. We have a weekly digest where we kind of pull through every week painstakingly all the kind of interesting things out there around food policy and food policy and practice. Um, it's a great read. Every It's a quick scan and 30 seconds change your life. So go to nycfoodpolicy.org. We have two events to consider. One on the 9th will also be same time, same place. Um, we have someone from Brazil coming in to talk about pet risk of pesticide. He's a world-class expert on it. And, and what it's actually doing to people. Um, and then on uh, Monday, the 14th, I know a lot of you kind of shut down when you hear the word technology, but I have a panel of experts that are, have been really focusing on how the food systems movement can advance using technology. We're 20, the food systems movement, food policy organizations are 20 years behind what's going on in technology. So, you know, I, this, this panel is to stimulate thought with community-based organizations and government, and we're very, very excited about it. And again, it's Monday on the 14th, same time, same place. Very easy to remember, and always the breakfast with the oatmeal. 
Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, and thanks so much for coming, and uh, have a great happy. weekend. It's going to be beautiful. Get out there and garden. Hey, everybody, while I still have everybody here, please just remember the root of all of this is, is education. We... You heard me say the state of the schools that we serve here. This is your city as well as ours. It's your tax dollars allowing a school to educate children to have no art, no gym, no music. What do you want from these children? We could do much better than that. How do we teach a child and expect them to be anything? Um, so just please keep that in mind. Um, and don't forget to vote.